Ever since her best friend was killed in a car accident, 17-year-old Catherine has been haunted by the thoughts of that terrible night. So when on a visit to her grandmother's church, Catherine meets a handsome young stranger who tells her he can channel the dead. She's eager for him to put her in touch with her lost friend in hopes that she can finally put her mind at ease. But the stranger may not be all that he appears. Catherine is the only one who seems to notice when he's around, and an elderly woman warns her to stay away from the church where she meets with him. Most alarming of all, he seems to be connected to a number of girls who have mysteriously disappeared, and they all bear a striking resemblance to Catherine. Despite her misgivings, Catherine is desperate for the stranger to help her make contact with her dead friend. Will she risk meeting him, even if it means putting her own life in danger? I'd come to California to spend Christmas with my grandmother because she'd written and invited me to be with her while my mom and dad were in Europe. She'd love to have me, she'd said, and they'd probably thought it would be wonderful me, and they'd probably thought it would be wonderful for me to get away from home, away from Chicago and all its heartache. Dr. West might have even suggested it. A change would be the best thing for her, she would have said. She was probably right. So here I was. It was my first day, and although it wasn't Sunday, I'd come to the church with Grandma because she volunteers in the office, and she refused to leave me alone. So she was in the office with three other volunteers, typing the church bulletin on the church's new iMac. She'd introduced me to her co-workers, and I had repeated the names to myself so I'd remember them. Now, I was up in the gallery exploring. The gallery wasn't used these days since the congregation had shrunk. By the look of it, it wasn't clean very often either. I was standing, looking down, fighting a sneeze, when a soft voice spoke right next to me. Catherine! I gave a startled yelp and jumped sideways. Hey! I spun around. I thought I was alone, and I was. There was nobody, but I'd heard my name. Who's there? My voice was wobbly. I went up a step and looked along the length of the next pew, wall to wall, empty. But there had to be somebody. Silence pressed around me. Was someone lying down along the floor out of sight? I didn't want to walk all the way up to the last row. What if the someone reached out, grabbed my ankle, and pulled me down? Only silence. In a rush now, I started towards the stairs that led back down to the vestibule below. And I was telling myself, you only imagined it, Catherine, but I knew I had it. And I was remembering how, after Christy died, I dreamed about her and thought I'd hear her voice whispering, help me, help me, the way she had that night. And it had been so real, as real as this. The thought made me feel worse. Was I going wacky again? I was out now at the top of the stairs, my breath sobbing in my throat. And then I was scurrying down the steps slipping, my elbows bumping against the banisters, almost down, almost down, glancing over my shoulder at the emptiness behind me. That nice old man, Mr. Ramirez, Arthur, Grandma had called him, was pushing through the heavy front doors. He was carrying an egg crate tray with five paper cups on it. I got you a Coke. Diet, he said uncertainly. Is something wrong? So why don't you and Arthur go have a look at the sanctuary, sweetheart? Grandma said gently, and Arthur immediately set down his paper cup. The numbing chill followed us into the lobby. The church is made of stone and old bricks, Arthur said. I think that's why we get these sudden updrafts of cold air. Cracks in the mortar, you know? Last earthquake, he stopped for effect. Last earthquake, the church got shaken up. We lost part of the steeple. Now we're told we need a retrofit, but that takes money, something we always seem to be short of. I nodded. I'll just leave you to yourself for a few minutes, Arthur whispered, and I heard him tiptoe away from me, heard the small whoosh as the door swung closed behind him. He knew what had happened, of course. He'd heard the exchange between Maureen and me, but even without that, he would have known from my grandmother how sad and miserable I was, and he had faith in the power of this holy quiet to comfort me. I tried to push away the thoughts that came crowding in my head. Be at peace, I told myself, but it wasn't going to be that easy, even here. So think about something else, that voice, that unseen person. I shivered and took a quick, nervous glance around the empty sanctuary. Don't think about that either, okay? Think about mom and dad. Going to grandma's will be good for you, mom had told me. I don't think I want to go. I won't be able to be cheerful. It's so rotten to be leaving you at Christmas, mom said. You know we try to turn it down, but dad's firm. Well, anyway, she's added vaguely. Dr. West thinks it will be for the best. Dad stroked my hair. Grandma won't expect you to be cheerful. You'll be comfortable with her, the way you always are. My mind jumped to the drive through the early morning streets of Chicago. Snow piled up, dirty on the sides of the state street. Christmas banners blowing in the frigid wind, the plane, the delay while they defrosted the wings, and then defrosted them again. Grandma waiting for me at the airport in Los Angeles, driving me through the city, where there was no snow, only palm trees and traffic and bustle and sunshine. 
Same world, I thought, just different. Better for me for a while. My legs ached where they had been broken, and I realized I'd slipped onto my knees. I straightened and rubbed at the pain. My chest ached too where my ribs had cracked. I concentrating on slowing my breathing. Catherine, such a soft voice. Gentle. I jerked upright, holding onto the seat in front. Same voice. Same. My heart began a slow, steady thumping. It must be someone carefully hidden. Please, please don't do this to me, I whimpered, but my words seemed to fall one by one, soundlessly in the empty space. I clawed my way out of the pew. Thank you for enjoying this story, The Presence by Eve Bunting, adapted by Ava Grant. If you enjoyed this story, you can find more stories like this one and other projects from our media studios. Search for our channel called WJHS Studios.